With that, Proverbs chapter 19 tonight. We're going to pick it up where we left off on Thursday nights. We're going through the Bible, book by book and chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And uh, as you know, <laughs> we're going to try, we've been trying every week to see if we can get through two chapters. And we have failed miserably the last three weeks. What's, some of you are saying, what's this we stuff? You, <laughs> don't put that on us. Well, it's like Tom said to me uh, tonight that uh, we're not in, in a hurry. It's the quality, not the quantity. And this is such a powerful and amazing book of wisdom. We don't want to rush through it and miss anything that the Lord has for us. So we'll see how far we get, but we'll pick it up in chapter 19. We got through chapter 18 last week. And uh, actually before we do, I just wanted to mention, I don't know if you heard the breaking news uh, tonight, just about, I think it's been a couple hours ago now, maybe three hours ago now, this Qasem uh, Salamani, this top Iranian military commander, was taken out by the U.S. in Iraq. This is big. This is really big. I posted on social media that uh, the whole world is on high alert. I was kind of uh, following this and really, of course, watching this very closely. But for those of us who know Bible prophecy, this is very exciting. Uh, and to see what's going to happen as a result of this. I, I just want to kind of put it into perspective how big this is. Uh, this Salamani was the most powerful man in Iran, even more powerful than the president of Iran, Rouhani. He was directly next to the supreme leader, the Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, this man was a bad actor. Uh, a lot of blood on his hands, a lot of American blood on his hands. And what's so striking, I should probably use a different word than striking, but what's so uh, interesting, perhaps a better word, is that he was in, of all places, Baghdad. What's he doing there? Oh, he is, and I should say was, <laughs> past tense, at the helm of this attack on the U.S. Embassy there in Iraq. And there was some breaking news. In fact, my uh, friend Kelly McGuire that works at Fox News in New York uh, sent me a text about in uh, Arabic is written on the wall that this Salamani was their leader. Whose leader? Oh, the Iraqis there in Iraq. What's Iran doing there? Oh, they're stirring things up. This was an attack. I had one, uh, I read one, I don't want to go off on this too much. <laughs> okay, maybe a little bit, but um, I, I bet you can't guess what we're going to be talking about on Sunday morning, right? But um, I, I was reading one commentary and uh, uh, they, they were talking about how to call him a terrorist would be a gross understatement. And to compare him to someone like Osama bin Laden, not even on the same level. This guy was, I mean, you cannot even imagine some of the uh, articles written about him, the power that this man had all over the world. I mean, he controls right now. I'm talking like he's still alive. I've been following this guy, not on Twitter or social media, but I've been uh, following this bad actor for many years. Uh, he was instrumental in the infamous, for lack of a better way of saying it, nuclear deal with Iran when uh, Barack Obama was president. And this guy is, was, <laughs> there I said is again, was a very, very uh, evil man. So. Uh, I guess Benjamin Netanyahu has cut a trip short and is heading back now uh, to Israel in light of the breaking news. So uh, I just, I'll just say one last thing here. So what I posted on 
social media was, following very closely the breaking news about top Iranian commander Qasem Soleimani being killed in a U.S. strike in Iraq. The whole world is now on high alert. So too should Christians be on high alert, watching and praying, Luke 21, 28. For those of us who are uh, students of Bible prophecy and are watching with great anticipation for the Lord's return, this is very exciting. To those who are not, this is terrifying, and rightfully so. It can be very interesting to see how this plays out in the days and weeks ahead. But tonight is not a prophecy update. Tonight is a Bible study in the book of Proverbs. So why don't we pray? We'll ask God to bless our time together, if you would join with me. Thank you, Lord. Lord, we're so grateful to You for Your Word and this time that we have together on Thursday nights, where we can just come together and put aside all the busyness of our lives and focus our attention on You and Your Word and that which You have for us here in Your Word. Lord, tonight we want to give You our undivided attention. And as we do, we are looking to You to speak into our lives, in and through Your Word and by the Holy Spirit in that still, small voice of the Holy Spirit. So Lord, thank You. In Jesus' name, Amen and Amen. All right, let's jump in. Verse 1. Better is the poor who walks in his integrity than one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. So right out of the chute, this is a very interesting proverb, and I want to draw your attention to this word integrity. Now we're probably prone to understand this word as being synonymous with honesty, nothing wrong with that, but there's actually a a deeper meaning to the word integrity. And I want to use it in the context of how it is used when someone will say something to the effect of, this has structural integrity. In other words, it won't bend, it won't cave, it won't falter, it won't break, because it has integrity. And this is what the proverb is saying, that it is better to be honest, walk in integrity, and be poor, as opposed to one who does cave in to the temptation to be dishonest, to not walk in integrity. And when they think that it can be to their advantage, maybe something they do, something they say, It's better to maintain your integrity, even if it means that you don't get ahead and you remain in poverty. Better to have integrity. Verse 2, also, it is not good for a soul to be without knowledge. And this is interesting, (laughs) he sins who hastens with his feet. In other words, you rush into things, pretty good chance you're going to regret it. I have never regretted waiting. I have always regretted my haste in making a decision, rushing into things without really taking the time. And oh, the regret that will always ensue when we rush into things and don't wait verse 3. The foolishness of a man twists his way, and his heart frets against the Lord. In other words, there's this man who totally messes up his life. I mean, he just makes a complete mess of everything. Everything is just messed up. Who's he going to blame? The Lord. Oh, he's certainly not going to take the blame himself. He's not going to take responsibility for what he's done, the consequences of his own actions. And that man 
is a fool. Verse 4, wealth makes many friends, but (laughs) the poor, forgive me for laughing, but this is so true, isn't it? But the poor is separated from his friend. And we're going to see this again come up in a couple of verses, and we'll expound maybe more on it. But isn't this just so true? In fact, especially for somebody who's single, and they have wealth. I mean, surely you're not going to know if those who want to be your friends want to be your friends for the right reason. And that's the problem that comes packaged with being wealthy. And here's the, again, we'll talk more about this, but here's somebody who's poor. And I mean, who wants to be friends with somebody that can't do anything for you, can't give anything to you? By the way, that's the measure of a character, isn't it? When you're friends with somebody, knowing full well that you're not going to get anything out of it. I mean, isn't it true that we are prone to become friends with, want to be friends with those that could actually further our careers, those that could actually advance us and be an advantage or a benefit to us. Verse 5, this is an interesting proverb. A false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies will not escape. They might think they're going to get away with it. They won't. In the end, ultimately, their sin will find them out. Be assured of it. I was reading a a commentary on this verse, and interesting insight, because the suggestion was that we should not let a false witness go unpunished. We should not let them get away with it. We should not let them escape. And certainly this could have application in the context of parenting. There has to be discipline, especially when it comes to lying. And I'll explain why I say that. Keep in mind, the devil is the father of lies. When he speaks, that's his native language. He's the father of lies. I've heard it said like this, that we are never more like the devil than when we lie. Lying is very serious, and it must be taken very seriously. I knew a guy on the mainland many, many years ago that, oh my goodness, if somebody lied, you would think that they had just committed the unforgivable sin. I mean, he would take them to task, and really, in all fairness, rightfully so, because it was a nipping it in the bud. It was dealing with it so as to not let them get away with it. Verse 6, here it is again. Many entreat the favor of the nobility, and every man is a friend to one who gives gifts. That's the person we want to we want to be with, right? That's the person we want to be friends with. You know, it's interesting in the gospels what I find the savior doing is he's actually a friend to those who can do nothing in return. He was attracted to the poor, the blind, the lame, the cripple. Verse 7 kind of takes it even further. All the brothers of the poor hate him. How much more do his friends go far from him? He may pursue them with words, yet they abandon him. You know, I was thinking about this as a pastor. I have to be really careful when it comes to this. So somebody walks, and James talks about this, somebody walks into the church and they appear, outwardly at least, to have means, have the world's wealth. And, you know, of course, as a pastor, it's kind of like, hey, welcome to Calvary Chapel Kaneohe. Can I get you anything? 
I mean, I, I, I want to be friendly with them, welcoming to them. Why? Because, look. I mean, and in, then in walks somebody who looks like they may be homeless. That's the true test. How am I going to respond to them? Am I going to be friendly with them? Yeah, I, I know I've shared this. I, I, I just want to share it again. I hope you don't mind. True story. Happened many years ago. And this young man walks into a Cadillac dealership. And he's wearing jeans and a t-shirt and kind of ripped and doesn't look like he could afford to buy the uh, brochure for the car, let alone the car. And nobody gives him the time of day. Nobody welcomes him. They, what's he here for? A job application? And they wouldn't even give him the time of day. Finally, this young salesman just asks him, is, is there something I can do to help you? And the kid says, well, as a matter of fact, there is. And so he reaches in his pocket and he pulls out this list. He says, you know, my dad sent me in to order these custom stretch limousine Cadillacs. And can you help me with that? Oh, yeah, yes, I absolutely can. By the way, we get paid on straight commission here. And all these other salesmen are looking at this young guy that all he did was, how can I help you? This is what we're told in Scripture, that man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. You know, when I was with Mercedes Benz for a number of years, again on the mainland, I was very careful when it came to this, because usually it was the guy that came in dressed to the nines. I mean, he looked like, you know, wow, this guy, he can buy something. Turns out he was a dreamer. You know, he was a complete, you know, fake. He was, how do they say it, fake it till you make it. <laughs> and sometimes they would just come in, get the brochure, put it on the refrigerator and just dream about being able to buy that car. It was the guy who would walk in, if it was in the summer, with shorts and slippers and a t-shirt, well, unassuming. You know, we're judging by the outward appearance. Oh man, who, who's this guy? Is he looking for a job? No, he's looking for a car. And oh, by the way, he'll pay cash. You've got to be really careful when it comes to this. I think we make these judgments outwardly when we assess people. We, you know, we size them up. We look at them outwardly and we say, man, look at that guy. <laughs> I just thought of this funny. Had somebody come and visit, again, this was on the mainland, visit the church, and they had never been to the church. They didn't know who the pastor of the church was. And so they're sitting there, and I get up, and th they shared this with me afterwards, if, if you can imagine. So they're sitting there going, oh, who's this guy? Oh, he, oh good. He's just doing the announcements. Whew. For a minute there, I was thinking he was the pastor. And then he's, after the sermon, sharing this with me, he said, and then you started preaching. I thought, he is the pastor. He doesn't look like a pastor. Oh, I didn't know that pastors were supposed to look a certain way. What you, what, you don't like my face? I was born with this face. Why are you looking at the outward appearance? God looks at the heart. Anyway, imagine my shock. I was shocked that he actually stayed for the entire sermon. Oh well. Verse 8, He who gets wisdom loves his own soul, he who keeps understanding will find good. Notice the delineation here between getting and keeping. Just because you get something doesn't mean you're going to keep it. And by the way, if you get wisdom, <laughs> you're doing so because you love yourself, your own soul. You know, we talk a lot about, you know, I just need to love myself more. No, you don't. You know, we're told to love others as, you know, our, love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And then there are those who say, well, the problem is, is I can't love my neighbor as I love myself because I don't love myself. Yes, you do. You absolutely love yourself. That's not the problem. That's never the problem. The problem is loving your neighbor as you already love yourself. 
And so here the proverb is saying that if you really love your own soul, you want to benefit yourself, get wisdom. And then once you get it, hold on to it, keep it, keep understanding. And if you do, you will find good. Verse 9, here we go again. And notice the repetitiveness, the reoccurring themes here in verse 9, a false witness will not go unpunished, and he who speaks lies shall perish. I mean, that's just the bottom line. No matter what, in the end, they will not go unpunished. Verse 10, luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a servant to rule over princes. Here you have this fool <laughs> sitting in the lap of luxury, as we might say, it doesn't fit, it doesn't work. Something's wrong with this picture. You won't see that, a fool sitting in luxury, nor will you see a servant ruling over princes. Verse 11, the discretion of a man makes him slow to anger, and his glory is to overlook a transgression. Think of it this way. You have a choice. Somebody says something. Somebody does something. And the flesh is right there, isn't it? Ready to react. In a, How dare you say that to me? Do you know who I am? <laughs> That's just pure pride, nothing but. But it's one who has discretion, one who is slow to anger. You know what? It brings God glory to overlook it. Some translations render this to pass over it. Think about what's been overlooked in our lives. I mean, the, when the shoe's on the other foot, as we say, it is a glory, His glory, to overlook a transgression. Verse 12, the king's wrath is like the roaring of a lion, but his favor is like dew on the grass, grass refreshing <laughs> the king's wrath, his countenance. Verse 13, a foolish son is the ruin of his father and the contentions of a wife or continual dripping. I, I was not wanting to laugh, but my wife's not here, so I can actually talk about this a little bit. A contentious woman is like a continual dripping. I, I feel sorry for this husband, for this father, a foolish son, a contentious wife. Who could stand that? We, we've read and we'll see again in the book of Proverbs how it is that it's better to eat a crust of bread on the roof of your house than it is to eat this steak dinner, prime rib, in the house where there's contention, where there's strife, where there's nagging. Verse 14, houses and riches are an inheritance from fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. In other words, a father can leave his house, his property, his riches, his wealth as an inheritance. But there's one thing he can't do. He can't leave a wife for his son. A prudent wife is from the Lord. The writer of Hebrews says, the one who finds a wife finds a good thing and obtaineth favor from the Lord. I have that memorized because my wife made me memorize that verse. <laughs> verse 15, laziness casts one into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. You know, it's interesting, the, the lazier you are, the lazier you will be. Let me say the same thing in a, in a different way. You know, when you're uh, uh, sedentary, lazy, then your whole body just kind of, and, and the more you sleep, the more you sleep. The more you sleep, the more you sleep. Sleep begets sleep. And the proverb here, the warning here is that that person will be in want, will suffer hunger. This is going to come up again. Verse 16, he who keeps 
The commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of his ways will die. I mean, this is a life and death matter here, obedience, obeying the commandments of God. You know what's harder than living an obedient life? Living a disobedient life. The Bible says the path of the sinner is hard. I mean, we we have this picture in our mind. And of course, the enemy uh, doesn't help when he paints this picture of disobedience as sin, and, and sin as being this pleasurable thing. And certainly sin is pleasurable for a season. That's going to come up again here in a little bit. But we don't realize the aftermath of it. I mean, To take care concerning the commandments of the Lord can be a life and death matter. Verse 17, this is interesting too. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. If you're looking for a a good investment opportunity, right here. Because when you lend help, the poor who we will always have with us, by the way, the Lord takes note of that. The Lord notices that, and that blesses the heart of God. And God will repay you many times over when you help the poor. Verse 18, chasten your son while there is hope. This was one that we always talked about with our boys when they were young. (laughs) Chasten your son while there is hope, and do not set your heart on his destruction. In other words, if you refuse to discipline your children, in effect, you are party now to the destruction that will come because you refuse to chasten them and discipline them. Keep in mind that the word discipline comes from the word disciple, to train, is to train them, to disciple them, to discipline them, to provide for them direction, instruction. Verse 19, a man of great wrath will suffer punishment, for if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. In other words, he needs to taste from the cup of the consequences of his short fuse for lack of a better way of saying it. Great wrath, the the punishment that comes, the consequences that come when somebody is just, I mean, anything sets them off. This, This anger, this hot temper that they have. If you rescue them, you're going to have to do it again, because they're not going to learn their lesson. Verse 20, listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. This speaks to while you're young, when you're young, receive instruction, be teachable. You know, in the, we call them the pastoral epistles, the epistle to Timothy and that of Titus. And therein you have these qualifications for those who aspire to some position of leadership. And there are certain qualifications. And the idea is that if you can't have your own house in order, then how can you be in a leadership position in the church? So get your house in order first. And so the qualifications are they must be temperate, They must be a one woman man. Many people misinterpret that, the husband of one wife, meaning they can never be divorced. We're going to talk about that here in a little bit too. But that's not what it's saying. It's saying they can't be a womanizer. You can't put a man in leadership that's a womanizer. But then it also, depending on the translation that you're reading, says they have to be apt to teach, able to teach. And many have thought, well, they need to be teachers then. That's not what that's saying. You know what that's saying? They need to be teachable. Teachable. They have to be teachable. You cannot put somebody in a position of leadership unless and until they have demonstrated that they are teachable. They're willing to receive instruction. That, we had a 
back on the, again, I use everything from the mainland. It's safer that way. Uh, we had a, a, an acronym. It was sort of a litmus test by which we gauged if somebody was somebody that we wanted to put in a position of, of leadership. And it was the acronym FAT. I know that's not politically correct anymore to use words or let alone acronyms like that, but it was FAT. They had to be FAT. Faithful, available, and teachable. They, they didn't have to be qualified. We weren't looking for the impressive resumes. In fact, sometimes it was the impressive resume that you wanted to stay away from, because they were, they were already a know-it-all. And boy, they're going to teach you a thing or two. They're not teachable. <laughs> they're not available. They're not faithful. They're so full of themselves. And isn't it true that when we're full of ourselves and we think we know it all, then we're not going to listen to what somebody has to say to us. We're not going to receive it. We're not going to receive instruction. See, younger in life, and oh, how I wish when I was young that I would have understood the importance of this. Because when you get older, and you do get older, <laughs> in your latter days, there is wisdom that comes. And please remember that knowledge is just information, but wisdom is the application of that information. That's why it is that you can have a very smart fool. I mean, they know a lot, but they're so foolish. And you can have a not so smart, wise person. I mean, I'm not the smartest you know, guy in the room, but there, that's not synonymous with wisdom. Neither is being knowledgeable synonymous with wisdom. I mean, I, I think even as I say this, maybe somebody comes to mind. They're very knowledgeable, but they're very foolish. They're just fools. They make foolish decisions. You know, when um, the Apostle Paul says that knowledge puffs up, knowledge puffs up. I mean, you can be so knowledgeable and nobody can tell you anything. And whoever wants to be around a know-it-all, I mean, they always have to have the final word. And they know everything about everything. Who wants to be around that? That's what this is saying. Verse 21, there are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel that will stand. In other words, you have plans. It's good to have plans. Don't let those plans have you. And hold on loosely to those plans, because ultimately in the end, the Lord is going to determine the outcome. So we make our plans. We should always preface any plan with Lord willing. James talks about this as well. Don't say we're going to go into such and such a city and do business there and make a profit there. You should always say, Lord willing. Lord, this is my plan, but not my will be done, your will be done. I want what you want, because Lord, I know that what you want for me is the best possible outcome. So the Lord's counsel, that will stand. Verse 22, what is desired in a man is kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. Again, that's a repetitive and recurring theme. I want to draw your attention to the beginning of this proverb. What is desired in a man is kindness. Think of it this way. What is attractive in a man is kindness. We, do, we desire to see and are attracted to someone who is kind. And boy, in this day and age in which we live, does not kindness stand out? It was a couple months ago, maybe longer than that now, I, I almost broke from our expositional teaching, and I wanted to do a topical teaching just on the topic of kindness. Kindness is so attractive. Humility is so attractive. It's so desirable. That's what the proverb is saying. And certainly 
this was true of the Savior. You know, one of the things that is really intriguing to me is how approachable Jesus was, especially to little children. They, they weren't intimidated by Him. In fact, they were attracted to Him. I am personally of the belief that it was His gentleness, His kindness, His humility, His meekness. It's so attractive. And isn't it true that we're attracted to that kind of person, the person who is humble and kind and gentle? We desire that. We're attracted to that. By the way, I'm convinced that that's why we always want the underdog to win. We're attracted to the underdog. There's, there's that dynamic. I always think of the the original Rocky movie. I, I'm not talking about Rocky 28. I don't know how many Rocky movies they have right now, but the original Rocky movie. And here's um, Rocky Balboa. Nobody ever heard of him. And it's supposed to be sort of a, you know, gesture with Apollo Creed. And he, he's the heavyweight champion, the all-time great. And so it comes time for the fight, right? And here's, here's Rocky Balboa. I can't believe I get to be in the same ring with, you know, Apollo Creed, man. And so here's all the, the pomp and the circumstance. Apollo Creed comes out. Na, 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 na. Sorry about that. I, don't, I forgot the words to the song. But I mean, he's, he's coming out with, you know, the music's playing. And then here comes Rocky Balboa. You know, walks out all, all humble, all, you know, he, you know, he's going to get killed. And so, you know, the crowd starts off, Apollo, Apollo. And then about the fifth round, you know, it's Rocky, Rocky. Why? Because he's the underdog. We're attracted to that. That's what we desire. I see it this way, and I say it this way. We are attracted to humility, but we are repulsed with pride. Pride is repulsive, and humility is attractive. And that's what this proverb is saying. Verse 23, the fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. Listen, every time, and there's going to be more times where we read about the fear of the Lord, I think it's incumbent upon me to explain what the fear of the Lord is and what the fear of the Lord is not, because there's a great misunderstanding when it comes to the fear of God. It's not this terrifying, trembling fear of God. Oh, no. The fear of the Lord, we're told in the Proverbs, is the beginning of wisdom. We're also told that the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. In other words, when you have such a fear and reverence and awe of God, you don't want to do anything that would grieve the heart of God. That's what it means to fear the Lord. You fear doing anything that would grieve the heart of God. We talked about this a little bit on Sunday. Grieving the heart of God. God can be grieved. We can actually, we have the propensity, the potential to grieve and bring sorrow to the heart of God. And so too, conversely, do we have the potential to bring great delight, great joy, and, and please God instead of grieve God. But when you love someone, you know, you fear doing anything that's going to be hurtful to them. I think I was sharing about this on Sunday, that I love my wife so much that I don't want to do anything. I fear doing anything that would hurt her or harm her or grieve her. That's what the fear of the Lord is. It's to hate the things that God hates. The fear of the Lord is to have a heart after God's own heart, as we're told of David. What does it mean to have a heart after God's own heart? It means to have a heart that seeks after the things of God, to have the heart of God, to desire the, the things of God. That's what having a heart 
after God's own heart is. It's a, I, I was thinking about uh, in the Old Testament, there was a time where we were told that there was no fear of God in their eyes. Now certainly it does carry with it the idea of having a, a fearful reverence, because yes, God is a loving God, but God is also a just God, and God will judge. And that is a healthy fear, by the way. There's an unhealthy fear, and there's a healthy fear. That is a healthy fear to fear the majesty of God, the might of God, Almighty God. That is a healthy fear. Verse 24, a lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. What a picture here. I mean, you got a guy sitting there eating, and I don't know, somebody must have served it to him, because apparently he's so lazy he wouldn't have made it for himself, right? So he's sitting there, and he, he puts his hand, this is the custom in the Middle East, you eat with your hands. So he puts his hand in the bowl to bring the food to his mouth, and he's so lazy, he won't even bring it from the bowl to his mouth. That's pretty lazy. Now you're looking at me going, what in the world, what kind of application can this possibly have to us tonight? I mean, I mean, I've, listen, I, I want you to know, I'm walking in victory with this proverb, okay? I have never been so lazy that I was unwilling <laughs> to bring the food to my mouth. That's, that's not a problem for me. I'm walking in victory in this area. Praise the Lord. I want to suggest a, a possibility here concerning the application of this proverb. What if we view this through the lens of being spiritually lazy. Stay with me. A spiritually lazy person is so spiritually lazy that they will not take the bread of life and eat it. Too lazy, spiritually lazy. I think that kind of changes the complexion of it a little bit, doesn't it? spiritual laziness, apathy, complacency, spiritually. Not just in the physical sense, certainly this has application in the physical sense, but I think even more so in the spiritual sense, just a spiritual laziness. Verse 25, strike a scoffer and the simple will become wary rebuke one who has understanding, and he will discern knowledge. This is carrying with it the idea of a scoffer, a mocker. You strike them, you rebuke them, and they'll beware, but they won't necessarily change. Whereas in contrast, the one who has understanding, he will discern, he will be discerning. He will be correct. He's willing to be corrected. You know, Proverbs 12, verse 1, you'll forgive me. I, one of my favorite Proverbs, for real, in all of the book of Proverbs, it's the one who is refusing to receive correction is stupid. No, that word stupid is in the Bible. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 1. In other words, you, you are unwilling to be rebuked. You are unwilling to receive instruction. You are unwilling to be corrected. And you don't learn. You won't learn. You're unwilling to learn. That's what this is talking about. Verse 26, he who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. I mean, I think this kind of speaks for itself. Any child that's going to dishonor their father and their mother. You know, that's the only commandment, and Paul writing to the Ephesians repeats this, the only commandment with a promise is the fifth commandment. Honor thy father and thy mother, so that the days upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee may be long blessed. The only commandment, and interesting, it's the fifth commandment. Five in scriptures, the number of grace 
It's the only commandment that has grace. The other nine commandments, thou shalt not, <laughs> and in the day that thou hast dust, thou shalt surely die. Have a nice afternoon. I mean, that's what the other commandments are. But that fifth commandment, it's, it's kind of nice. I mean, it's actually got a promise. That's what Paul says to the Ephesians. It's, it's the only commandment with a promise. It's got grace. And, a, and so appropriate that it be the, the fifth commandment, five, the the number of grace. You know, like seven is the number of completion, eight the number of new beginnings, number five is the number of grace, and grace changes everything. I was this, uh, this came to my mind, that when God changed Abram and Sarai's name to Abraham and Sarah, He took the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, and he put it in the fifth place in their name and completely changed their everything. Number five being the number of grace, the ha in the Hebrew alphabet, the number five. And it was not Abram, it was Abraham. It was not Sarai, it was Sarah. And he changed their name. Grace changes everything. Verse 27, Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. In other words, you, you stop listening to me, son, boy. <laughs> you stop listening to me, boy. And this is what's going to happen. You're going to stray from the words of knowledge. Verse 28, a disreputable witness scorns justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. Uh, one who has no reputation, and now they're bearing witness. They have no regard for justice. They, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. It's almost like the mouth of the wicked, they, they have an appetite for iniquity. They just have a taste. They've developed a taste for it. Verse 29, judgments are prepared for scoffers and beatings for the backs of fools. Again, it kind of speaks for itself. This is one of those chapters in Proverbs that you could put a caption on, and the caption would have to be something along the lines of, the importance of family relationships. I mean, it just kind of is the common denominator from this chapter here in Proverbs. God's Word places a high priority on the family dynamic, and for a reason, and good reason. The family is a microcosm of our heavenly family. The family is a microcosm of heaven. We have our heavenly Father. We're children of God, sons and daughters of God. How about this? <laughs> As the church of Jesus Christ, we are betrothed to our bridegroom, Jesus, and we're the bride of Christ. Now guys get kind of messed up on that. I don't, I'm the bride? Yeah deal with it. I mean, in heaven there's not going to be any difference between male and female. And this is interesting, there's no marriage in heaven, we're told. The only marriage in heaven is going to be our marriage to the Lamb, to Jesus Christ, who we are betrothed to as the bride of Christ. And by the way, oh, and we're brothers and sisters in Christ, siblings in Christ, which can in some way explain why it is that we have sibling rivalry in the church, in the body of Christ. We're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. This is where it gets interesting. As the bride of Christ, it's a type of the marriage. And this is why it is that God hates divorce. And actually, I think I just want to end with this. Uh, we'll pick it up in chapter 20, Lord willing, next week. But uh, this is important. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself why, the question of why, when it comes to certain passages in Scripture? Example, we're told that God hates divorce. The question 
should be one of why. Why does God hate divorce? Please know that God does not hate the divorced. No, He hates divorce because of what divorce represents. See, it ruins the type. See, if marriage is a microcosm of our relationship, our covenant with Jesus Christ as our bridegroom, if, if that is a type and then there's a divorce, then that ruins the type. And one need look no further than to what Moses did in ruining the type. It cost him the promised land. So the children of Israel were there in the wilderness, and they're so thirsty, and they're complaining, and they want water. And God says to Moses, just strike the rock, and water will come out. So Moses strikes the rock, and sure enough, water comes out. And that was a type, because that rock is a type, a picture of Jesus Christ, from whom will come rivers of everlasting water from Him. But He had to be struck, crucified, killed. That was the type, the striking of the rock in order for everlasting life, the waters of everlasting life to come flowing out. So then it happens again. And the Israelites start complaining again. There they are in the wilderness, and they're so thirsty. And by the way, don't come down too hard on the Israelites. I, I have to confess that when they were delivered out of Egypt, and they come to the Red Sea, and they're like, were there not enough graves in Egypt? God had to lead us out here to kill us. And then God has Moses just take the rod, and he parts the Red Sea, and they walk on dry ground. And then you would think after that, wow, Lord, praise the Lord, hallelujah. And they did praise the Lord. Miriam went out in front, and they're just singing praises and thanking God. And they delivered, God delivered us from the Egyptians. And of course, the Red Sea, when the Egyptians tried to follow them, it came and it drowned all of the Egyptians. And so there they are on the other side of the Red Sea. And you would think that that would just settle it. They would always trust God. I mean, my goodness, after He just did that, I mean, we, we could trust God no matter what. Look what He's done for us. But it's only days afterwards that they start complaining again. Were there not enough graves in Egypt? He had to bring us out here to kill us. And there's a, there's a humorous, I, I love this because I love the Word of God. It's so honest. Moses and God are like having an argument. So God's like, your people, and Moses is like, they're not mine. It's <laughs> your people. And Moses is fed up with the Israelites, because all they do is murmur and complain. And Moses, at this point in his <laughs> leadership, says, I've had it with you. Here they are again, they're thirsty. And Moses says to them, how long do we, key word, have to put up with your complaining and your murmuring? And it's like God just pulls him aside and says, hey, Mo, get over here. What's this we stuff? We? Oh, you're on the same level as me now? We? He was so angry with them. God was not angry with them. So he, Moses is angry with them, and he's so angry. And God says, I want you to go not strike the rock, speak to the rock, and water will come out. And what does Moses do? He is so angry, he goes and he strikes the rock again, when he was only to speak to it. And he ruined the type, and it cost him entrance into the promised land. Why? Because that rock, Christ, was only to be struck one time. After Christ was crucified, now we can speak to Christ, and the life-giving water will come out and flow. He ruined the type. 
God takes very seriously the type. And that's why God hates divorce, because of what divorce does to the divorced. And it is a microcosm of our relationship with Jesus Christ. Why don't you stand? Again, we'll pick it up in chapter 20 next week. That's all right, one chapter a week. We're not in any hurry, right? Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you'll take what we've seen here tonight. <laughs> the thing about the book of Proverbs is it's so, there's so much, and there's so much truth, so much wisdom, so much that we can take with us from this Bible study tonight and apply to our lives. But Lord, we readily admit that we need the Holy Spirit to take that which we've seen here tonight and heard here tonight and begin that process of applying it to our lives, blessing it to our hearts. So Lord, will you do that for us? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.